I am Fabiola Palomino, your host. Welcome to the Immigrant Magazine program. Laurinda Hernandez Duran was our guest on our previous episode. Here are some clips. Was difficult because the weather. Difficult because I miss my family, of course. Language, yeah. But I'm the type of person who tries to just, just go for it. And I thought, okay, I live in Vancouver. Winter always is going to happen. And I'm not going to have miserable time every year. So I have to change my, my, uh, my perception. And I think that was the key. Because now I enjoy winter. Uh, well, yes, it's true. Back in Mexico, I was working as a full-time singer. I was teaching meditation because music, spirituality, and teaching always has been part of my life. Laurinda Hernandez was born and raised in Acapulco, Mexico. She practices holistic medicine. And listen, what was her answer when I asked her, how can we find happiness in difficult times? And how music can be effective to heal? Laurinda Hernandez, interview, second part. Well, in terms of uh, teaching and spirituality, I start a study. So I balance between taking care of my daughter and home and stuff. And, and I start studying reflexology. I start getting involved in different alternative therapies, uh, uh, meeting new people in that community, and practice more meditation, which I kind of like stop a little bit. So I reconnect with myself at that level, which I I get focused in what I want to be, where I want to go, and just take the steps. Our body, our emotions, and our mind and our energy are connected. So for example, if we, if we are in an unbalanced state of mind, for sure it's going to have some uh, effect in our bodies and in our health. It's super easy. If we are maybe depressed or we have this anxiety, we can sleep, we are so worried. Uh, at some point, our immune, immune system is gonna get low. When our immune system gets low, we are prone to get sick. With the energy side, when I say about spirituality, I don't mean religion. I'm talking more, more about you as who are you, uh, what are you doing here, what is your passion, what is your call. That's what I'm talking about in terms of spirituality, you as your soul, or wherever you want to go. So your soul, your energy, your mind, your emotion, it's really important to realize the most important is you are the one who has to take the responsibility to, to find that balance. Uh, you are the one responsible, but that doesn't mean you are al alone. It's so many help, it's so many uh, guides, it's just you have to realize that you have to take the responsibility over your health, over what you think, or the way you perceive life, and of course, uh, follow your passion. at least to be aware of the concept. To be aware of, yes, the way I feel is going to affect my body in a positive way or in a, ne or in a negative way. When we feel positive, we have a lot of energy and you want to accomplish so many things. When we are depressed, when we are frustrated, sometimes we don't want to do nothing. So first step is realize whatever you think will affect your body in a good way or in a bad way. I'm gonna say start from there. Take care of your emotion. Be aware of what are you thinking. I'm gonna say that's the first simple step. Happiness in difficult times. Hmm. I'm gonna say it again, it's about changing your perception. Because, for example, uh, it, it depends what happiness means. 
but let's say happiness in a difficult situation. For example, uh, one is to be grateful. Because sometimes we are in a certain situation and we don't realize that maybe other people, they have harder situations. So from that we can see, oh, maybe my situation is not that bad. I should be more grateful. So feeling grateful will give you a sense of happiness, for example. Um, maybe another way would be um, to realize the happiness is in you. Another example is sometimes we, we feel our happiness depends on other people. And if for some reason that people is gone, so we feel our happiness is gone. So also it's really important to realize happiness is in you, not outside. And if you have a hard situation, you just need to realize exactly what's going on in terms of uh, uh, and I'm not going to say it's not important, whatever the, the person is, is uh, living. But always see around what's going on. Be grateful. Uh, try to find a solution. Don't stay just there. That's really important. Don't stay just there. I'm not going to say just always pretend to be happy because that's not a solution either. But just don't stay too long there. Feel it. Um, I'm not happy right now. Okay, so now can, what can I do to feel happy? Find the good things that still are in your life. I'm gonna say that's, I think, the most simple step one, to find your happiness. Just see around and ask yourself, what can I do right now to feel better? Maybe it will be, I need to take a rest. Maybe it will be, okay, I need to take the first step and find a new job. Maybe it would be, okay, I need to take care of myself. Uh, I don't know, something like that. Mm -hmm. So happiness is in yourself. But at the same time, music doesn't have language. Well, I mean, it has, but I'm talking about, if you listen to music, you don't need to understand sometimes what's going on. You just hear the sound, it's uplifting. Mm -hmm. And everything that creates you this feeling of uplifting will be healing. Same with the dance. Uh, some people don't know how to dance, but they don't care. They just move. It's uplifting. So everything that creates this uplifting feeling will be healing and will give you happiness too. Success for me means first to feel in peace, peaceful. Second, doing what I like to do, which is what I'm doing right now. Uh, I think those two things, just feel peaceful and do what I really, really, really want to do. I mean, just follow my passion because every day I'm happy because I'm doing what I like. So I have that sense of accomplish. So that for me is successful. For some people it might be money. I'm not gonna say I don't need money, but some, some people is when I have like a two houses or when I have like a five cars or when I got this, I'm gonna be successful. For me, for me, successful is feel peaceful and to follow my passion. That's what I'm doing now, so yeah, I feel successful now. It has not happened to you that when you have to live with other members of your family, consistent can be very hard and difficult. In our mental health segment with Yolanda Montoya, how to face the consistency. ¿Qué tal amigos? Nuevamente aquí en su revista El Inmigrante, en su segmento Salud Mental. El tema de hoy es la convivencia armoniosa en la familia. ¿Por qué es importante el tener una convivencia armoniosa en la familia? Bueno, básicamente porque es el lugar en donde pasamos la mayor parte del tiempo descansando, relajados, siendo nosotros mismos, 
cuando regresamos de, eh, del trabajo, cuando eh, volvemos a casa, eh, podemos tener la posibilidad de guardar y dejar fuera toda esa careta o esas imágenes que eh, damos a, tenemos que dar al público, eh, al cliente, al jefe, a los amigos y eh, es la casa y el hogar en, con la familia en donde somos nosotros mismos, en donde pues, nos podemos quitar los zapatos y podemos estar más relajados y no estar con tanta eh, miramiento de, de no molestar al otro. Pero en este no molestar al otro eh, a veces nos pasamos y nos olvidamos que dentro de esta armo, eh, armonía existen también reglas en casa para eh, convivir. Es decir, si de pronto papá llega y quiere estar eh, con la familia eh, y llega a interrumpir, digamos, eh, la, la serie de televisión de los chicos porque toma el control y está él queriendo ver alguna película, rompe con esa armonía, pero está imponiendo su voluntad sin tomar en cuenta a los otros. A veces simplemente uno no se acuerda de que el otro también tiene necesidades, de que el otro también quiere hacer cosas, quizás con, con uno, pero, pero de una manera, eh, digamos, tranquila, de una manera armoniosa, de manera acordada. Y para esto existe la comunicación. Es muy importante mencionar que cuando uno no toma en cuenta al otro, surgen los conflictos, empiezan los enojos, los hijos a veces no quieren estar con nosotros, especialmente cuando son adolescentes, y hay que darles un espacio, no hay que obligarlos, hay que invitarlos, y que cuando ellos vengan realmente estemos en armonía, pero si eh, los forzamos, ni es una situación armoniosa, se sienten obligados y por el otro lado eh, eh, se surgen muchos conflictos porque ellos siempre van a estar tratando de estar molestándonos por, eh, para expresar su enojo de no querer estar ahí. Para, esta, para, para solucionar estos problemas es muy importante, como he dicho, la comunicación. Cuando uno no se comunica, las personas empiezan a generar conflictos entre sí y se los van guardando y a veces en lugar de hablarlos, más bien los actuamos. Yo siempre he dicho que lo que no se habla, se actúa. Y eh, si a veces uno como eh, eh, esposo o esposa no comunica lo que quiere hacer o decir eh, y, e impone, eh, la pareja empieza con ciertos recelos y resentimientos, se empieza a guardar cosas y hace quizás eh, cede por no tener problemas, por evitar conflictos, pero va guardando una serie de enojos hasta que llega un punto en donde empiezan las discusiones y empiezan los reclamos y todo esto frente a los hijos. ¿Y qué es lo que va pasando? Bueno, pues que los hijos aprenden, aprenden e imitan lo que nosotros hacemos. La convivencia en la familia a veces se torna muy difícil, especialmente por la rutina. Eh, y eh, básicamente eh, el, el no tener una actividad prevista con la familia para el fin de semana o para los ratos de descanso eh, promueve mucho el que las personas eh, se, eh, se conflictúen, eh, se chocan los intereses, bueno, es que yo quería ir a la fiesta, bueno, pues es que yo tenía un compromiso acá con mis amistades, dice la señora, bueno, pues el señor quizás tenga simplemente ganas de descansar y no salir a ningún lado, en fin. Pero, bueno, para esto es importante siempre llegar a acuerdos y comunicarse. Sin embargo, existe también otro punto muy interesante que quisiera tocar. ¿Qué sucede con estas familias nuestras en donde eh, hemos llegado a, a vivir a este país y en donde de pronto recibimos una visita de nuestra familia, nuestras familias de origen, que quizás no hemos visto por mucho tiempo? Pueden ser los padres, pueden ser los suegros, pueden ser los abuelos, los tíos, los cuñados, en fin. Eh, cuando tenemos estas visitas suelen generarse muchos conflictos y voy a poner un ejemplo muy simple. Eh, digamos que vienen los padres de María, que María está casada con Juan 
y tienen dos hijos, Gabriela y Daniel. Y Gabriela tiene 12 años y Daniel tiene 9. Y los dos comparten habitación porque la casa es muy pequeñita. Pero cuando vienen los abuelos de visita, pues simplemente papá y mamá determinan que los chicos van a dormir por estos días mientras estén los abuelos en casa, en la sala, porque se tiene un sofá cama y para los chicos es más fácil acomodarse en, el, en la pequeña sala que hay en casa. Sin embargo, no se les consulta a los chicos y simplemente se les, eh, se les ordena y se les dice que eso va a suceder. Eh, es importante recordar que los hijos también son personas y también tienen deseos y también se sienten intimidados y, y, e invadidos en sus espacios. Por lo tanto, es muy importante, primero que nada, hablarlo, decírselos, oigan, vienen los abuelos. No hay un espacio específico para ellos, desgraciadamente no contamos con otra recámara. ¿Qué les parece? Nuestra idea ha sido esta de papá y mamá, de poner, de que ustedes estén eh, durmiendo en la pequeña sala que tenemos. Es solamente por tres semanas. Can I tell you something? I consider myself a fervent admirer of all about planets constellations, the universe, etc. And also, I ask myself, what is it beyond the universe? Judy Migrant's Mana Since Program was invited to the grand opening of the Voyage of Time documentary. The past. The present. the future. Experience the unfolding of time. The universe. Billions of years in the making. Our journey. Our destiny. Voyage of Time. The IMAX experience. A friend, a colleague of mine, uh, who uh, uh, contributed some of the astronomical simulations that you saw near the beginning. Uh, he's now in Herefordshire in England, uh, and is married to one of our former graduate students uh, at UBC, Jim Geach. The astronomical simulations of the star and planet uh, formation, not so much the, uh, the simulated ancient uh, life uh, on Earth. Uh, but yeah, they are, uh, pretty much everything you saw there was based on, uh, on real uh, models, supercomputer models, what we call N-body, simulations where n is a very large number. Uh, the larger the number, the, uh, the more supercomputing power you need in order to figure out how uh, everything came together under gravity. And a lot of that gravity, as Brad Pitt mentioned in, the, uh, in his narration, is due to this invisible dark matter, uh, the stuff that uh, we, we know of it because of its gravitational effects so the things we can't see, but we can't actually see it. And, uh, and so when galaxies formed and so on, most of us would think of a galaxy as a, as a, uh, a swarm, a city of stars, of uh, hundreds of billions of stars and gas and dust. But now our perspective on galaxies might be a little different. It's actually an enormous like spherical cloud of mysterious dark matter with a sprinkling of stars and gas and dust at its very center where everything settled in underneath that, in that uh, gravitational well. Uh, so all of the simulations that I saw there uh, represented kind of the state of the art of our understanding uh, of how uh, stars came to be. And it's just, uh, it's, 
it's almost like artwork. And I wouldn't blame you for thinking it was just something that was made up in the in the mind of a, uh, a visual effects uh, artist. Uh, but uh, they were uh, genuine uh, embody hydrodynamical simulations of early starboard Earth and planet formation. So the question is. Uh, if, uh, if we were to find life in another world, and, and uh, part of my research is looking for uh, those worlds and the ones that might satisfy at least some of the conditions to uh, uh, support life, uh, would it be the same story as we find here? And it depends on how you look at it. In terms of the basic mechanisms, uh, we, all of these worlds are in the same universe, and we live in a universe that's governed by rules. Laws of nature, of physics, of chemistry, of biochemistry, and so there are certain things that you need, you know, for life to, to take place. But once you put those ingredients together, and we still don't know how you, you do that, how nature did it, uh, but then you wait for a long time. At least in this planet, the story of life on this planet is a is a roughly four billion year long uh, story, uh, and yet it's only in the last chapters of that story that life became more complicated than a microbe or a bacterium. And it's only in the last you know, paragraph of the story that uh, life ro you know, rose up on two legs. And it's only in the last word or possible punctuation mark of that story that we appear. Uh, and of course, it's not the end of the story. The story is still being written, but we're the most recent word or punctuation mark. And so, you know, with all of the roles of the die in terms of how over billions of years gradually evo evolution eventually, uh, uh, you know, exploded, the Cambrian explosion, and you, you saw that in the film where life developed its own defense mechanisms, it developed its own weaponry uh, to hunt and to escape from hunters and to be protected from hunters. Uh, that all happened relatively quickly. And so, if things happen elsewhere the way they happen here, maybe it takes a long time before you have that kind of explosion of biodiversity, but I don't know that uh, you would end up with things that looked and behaved in a familiar way, other than if you got down to the kind of the, the, uh, the cellular and the, the biochemical level. Um, you know, we'll just see the work of a great filmmaker uh, in the audience is, uh, a, a local you know, film and television maker, Trevor Kaywood, who's a colleague of uh, director Neil Blomkamp, who works out of Vancouver. And Neil was asked, the fellow who made District 9 with aliens that were called prawns, and he was asked once, did he think that aliens would look like the things that he had populated his film with? And he said, absolutely not. He said that when we finally find aliens, if we do, they will look like nothing like anything that you've ever seen in a movie, in a television show, or that you've read about in a, in a book. Uh, and I would agree with him there. I think the, the, uh, we, we only have one example of Life 1.0. We're looking for Life 2.0. And it's always dangerous to make too many assumptions based on only one example. Uh, so uh, I think we'll find things that are familiar in the basic uh, characteristics, but in terms of the detail, wouldn't even hazard to guess what uh, extraterrestrials would really look like and how they would behave and how they would think. But we now live in an era, all of us are you know, the first generation of our species that has the capability of finding places where uh, aliens might live and, and possibly uh, you know, finding evidence for life. I believe that in the next, say, uh, you know, 20 to 30 years that somebody will be announcing evidence of life, simple microbial life, not Vulcans, uh, you know, uh, on one of these uh, worlds in the habitable zone that we are discovering now. And that's just the recognition that, that life has sprung up somewhere else in the universe. And it will be one of the most profound you know, milestones in the history of our species. Before closing this episode 227, I want to tell you something. Your Immigrants Masses program is organizing a special event for you. Our wish is to know you in person and also to get 
feedback from you. Uh, we would like to know what kind of meat you have as an immigrant and also what kind of topic would you like to watch on our TV show. It's going to be very soon. Remember, we are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and YouTube. Now, if you didn't have time and this week to watch us, you can go to our website and click on episodes. Problemas de relaciones interpersonales, separación, divorcio, problemas con niños, adolescentes y adultos. Soy la doctora Yolanda Montoya, soy clinical counselor y mi teléfono es el 604-861-1071.